have you ever thought about making your own podcast? It seems like that's the end thing right now. Well, do I have the people for you? Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing your podcast. Best of all, it's 100% free and extremely easy to use. And now, Anchor will match with great sponsors who want to advertise on your podcast. That means you can get paid for podcasting right away. To get started, go to anchor.fm slash start. Once again, that's anchor.fm slash start. Welcome back, everybody, to the episode of the Jay Stevens Podcast, part of the Off the Ball Network. This is episode 199, dedicated to a man who won May 27th, 2018, became the first Australian driver to win the Indianapolis 500, Mr. Will Powers. And as always, thank you for listening and downloading another episode of the podcast. On today's episode, we're joined once again by my friend, Mr. Jeff Hunt, not only the host of the Jeff Needs Sports Podcast, but also the Jeff Needs Help Podcast as well, as him and I have part two of our conversation about ways to improve college football. Jeff and I are huge college football fans. I have done a show with him, the show, the series that I've done here a few times. going to bring that back, a live show on Facebook. Let Fans Talk with Jay Stevens is the name of that show. Be on the lookout for that very, very soon. If, if you don't catch it live on Facebook, the audio will be right here for you to enjoy. But with Jeff and I being college football fans and Ohio State Buckeye fans, we're always thinking about ways to improve the sport that we love. You're going to hear three more ways last week. The first three ways Two ways from Jeff, one from myself, and then today you get two ways from myself, one from Jeff, for us and to see how college football, a game that so many people love, can improve. But before we get to that, in today's opener, with today being about the college football, I said, why not go ahead and discuss my top five college football play-by-play broadcasters that I've been able to listen to and enjoy In my lifetime. A little honorable mention, not a long explanation, but when you hear the name, you'll understand there's two. Joe Tessitore, Mike Tirico. Honorable mention, as great as they are, the top five, to me, deserve to be in the top five. Number five, top five play-by-play broadcasters I've had the privilege of listening to and enjoying in my lifetime. Number five, Brad Nessler. Brad Nessler, to me, is immensely underrated. When he was at ESPN, I remember when I was a youngster, there would be numerous Big Ten football games or even latter part of the 2010s and um, the latter part 2000s and the 2010s where he was getting more prominent games on the ESPN. And I just loved Brad, his excitement, his consistency, his steadiness throughout the game and the ability to make a big moment even bigger than it already was. Brad Nestler comes in at number five, currently the broadcaster play-by-play broadcaster for the SEC game of the week on CBS I think Brad Nestler's work at the ESPN is why he was the one to take over for Vern Lundquist when Vern Lundquist stepped away from the broadcasting booth in college football he still does golf and he was doing some things for the PJ championship this past weekend number four this one might surprise you Gus Johnson Gus to me He's one of the better guys right now that's out there. Actually, those that are actually active, he is the highest rank that I have right now of those that are are currently broadcasting the college football. But Gus Johnson, his excitement, not just in the high moments, but when he opens a broadcast, you can look at that man dressed in his Sunday's best, ready to provide great commentary in great blow-by-blow action, not boxing, but you get what they say, blow-by-blow action or play-by-play action for the game that's about to be played over the next three and a half to four hours. And in those high moments, those exciting moments, you get a call that is very unique and something that only Gus Johnson could do. There are people out there that try to duplicate or replicate things they see in the booth. There's only one Gus Johnson, and let's keep it that way. Number three, mentioned him earlier, Vern Lundquist, I call him Uncle Vern. I've been doing that for a while. He is kind of like your grandpa or your uncle that's been around for a while. Seen so many games, so many great players, so many amazing moments. And as he's calling the game, 
even still, in his latter years, in his latter time, when he was calling the SEC game of the week, I mean, so many Iron Bowls, so many matchups between Georgia and Florida, so many SEC championships, and he still has that excitement that he has always had, not just from when he was younger, but also in his older years as well. Uncle Vern, as I call him, Vern Lundquist, number three. Number two, to this, to many people, he is the all-timer. To me, he is not. Keith Jackson. Now, I was not able to really enjoy Keith Jackson as much as the other men. The, when you hear number one, you'll understand why number one is what he is. But the granddaddy of them all, the Rose Bowl, so many broadcasts that Keith Jackson had, it was a steadiness through the broadcasts. Now, he was associated with big games, and even um, throughout early portions of his career, 70s, 80s, you, you go back and look at these broadcasts, he's broadcasting the biggest games. Even during a point in college football and TV broadcasting of sports, where you don't have the plethora of games, and every game is on TV, some way, either on demand, or digital, not on demand, or uh, online, that's the word I was looking for, or whatever network it is, so many games are broadcast that... It's different than it was back when he started where your game was the game. And if you called it, you're not just going to have the eyes of your peers watching. The entire country are, is focused on you. Keith Jackson, number two. Many he is number one. But number one to me is the man that I've been able to enjoy most of my lifetime. And he is the one that I do associate with big games. And I was very, very I won't say upset. Didn't really like the fact that uh, ESPN moved him from the game of the week to the primetime matchup on the SEC network. I get it. You bring in Fowler. You know Musburger's going to be moving on very, very soon anyway. But Brent Musburger, so many big games. Keith Jackson, the last game that he called was the famous Rose Bowl, USC versus Texas. To the quarter! When Vince Young went to the quarter to get that touchdown, Brent Musburger, you open, he, he opens a broadcast with the memorable phrase. I remember a phrase from Keith Jackson from his final call, one of his final call, fi final game. But Brent, Brent Musburger, you remember, you are looking live. And that's what we remember from Brent Musburger. He is now doing games on the radio for the Oakland Raiders. And honestly, I wish before he calls it quits, I know he's uh, big with v -Sin, They get sports and information network and the betting and the sports betting that he has going on there. But I just wish ESPN, ABC, one of y'all, somebody, Get him back on the NFL, because he was a studio host as well. Get him back with the NFL or college football before he calls it quits. Get him back inside. Allow him, allow him to call at least one more game on a big stage so you and I can hear for one more time on national TV, ABC, CBS. Doesn't matter. Let's go ahead and say it together. You are looking live as Britt Musburger opens up another phenomenal broadcast. Let's go ahead and take a trip to Northeast Ohio to enjoy part two of my conversation with my good friend, Mr. Jeff Hunt, as him and I discuss ways to improve the college football. <laughs> Jeff, number two on my list, this is something that you mentioned to me in a text as far as saying which one of us is going to pick this one. And I'm going to, once again, discuss a problem, a way we can improve and provide a solution. Solutions, there's two steps to it. It's also very easy. And then you could take a page from the Super Bowl, the NFL, college football, use the trickle-down effect, and you'll understand here in a second. Speed up the game. I went to a game, Jeff, 2015, my first Ohio State football game, regular season football game that I went to. It was Indiana versus Ohio State in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, Xander Diamond, third-string quarterback, came in and almost upset the Buckeyes the 2015 season with the ultimate loss to Michigan State. Yes, Zeke went off that game. He went off that game. So, Jeff, in that game, I, I've watched college football on TV my entire life. I don't know if it was just me, me being older, me being able, being able to understand life a little bit more, being more conscious of time. I felt like that game was never going to end. 3.30 kickoff, we leave, it was cold, it was raining. We, we, left, the, we left around, what was it, a four, four and a half, four hour and 15 minute game. And I'm like, whoa, 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 time out, time out, time out. So it was at that point I started to actually look at and realize, wait, are all games like this? Are all games really taking this long? And so I watch, I look at the network, I look at the TV, and I look at, you know, the old um, TV guide that we used to get. You get to see how, uh, how long each show is supposed to be. So I, yeah, yeah, there you go. And so I was looking at that on the TV at least, and it said, well, 
the 12, the, the new 12 o'clock game. I'm used to NFL, three hours in and out, quick, easy, like clockwork, baby. We're moving on to the next, next game. So a 12 o'clock game ends at three. You get 30 minutes of game day or the filler time, 3.30 the next game. All right, cool. That's not bad. But when I start paying more attention, Jeff, that 12 o'clock game didn't get over until 3.30, sometimes 4 o'clock. And you're having to use that 3.30 game has to overlap, go to a back network, ESPN News, to try to say, oh, we're going to still air this game just a little bit later, a different network, because, well, we can't properly map out how long these games are going to go. And it was not just that game, Jeff. I know numerous games. Since I started hosting Locked on Buckeyes, I've been really conscious, like, man, these games are long. And it's a problem. It's not a problem that just comes up now. ESPN saw the same thing you mentioned, Disney owning ESPN and ABC. Disney even said, well, I don't know if it's Disney or ABC. They said, look, you guys, the ABC game starts at 8 o'clock. It's been starting at 8 o'clock for so long. Well, I think the human the human itself, we've evolved and said, no, we ain't going to stay up that late to watch y'all. They moved that game up to 7.30. It's a wise move. We see it in the NBA, TNT, ESPN. They moved their late game up about 30 minutes, sometimes an hour if they can, and it's very, very wise. The first play-in game in the Eastern Conference, the Pacers and Hornets play at 6.30, Jeff. I think they're getting wiser and saying, we can't keep having these games go past till, till 12.31 in the morning. Cats got to go to school. Kids got to, I mean, kids got to go to school. You and I have to go to work. Your wife has to get, you got to get some sleep. So I think they're realizing these games are going too long. Well, these, we can't go too late, but they're not fixing the solution as far as the game going for so long. Two quick ways, Jeff. I know that's a long explanation for why the game needs to be sped up, but two ways it can happen. One, take something from the NFL. Don't stop the clock on every first down. I've been, that's been a pet peeve of mine for a very, very, very long time. When I play the video game, it's easy because it helps me out. It gives a couple of seconds longer to pick my next play if I want to go hurry up or not. But also, another way, notice I said something from the NFL and the Super Bowl, shorten your timeouts. And these advertisers, these sponsors, they'll throw the money at you to get that space. I know with college football, they're saying, well, if we don't, if we don't fit in all of our sponsors, we'll get less money wrong we learn from the super bowl learn from the nfl if you if you dictate things the money that these companies have they'll throw it at you the super bowl i told my dad this and i'll shut up because i know i talked for a very long time the super bowl halftime the super bowl halftime show the performer does not get paid i don't know when that was started but um the weekend it'll beyonce um uh, i don't know if justin timberlake years ago if he did it or not um but they don't get paid the NFL says, look, if you want to perform here, you're putting your money out. You're the one that is paying for everything. I think the weekend spent $12 million on that performance. My dad said, how do they get their money? By exposure. The next 12 to 24 hours, their, their downloads skyrocket. The amount of money they get skyrockets just from being there for that 20-minute or 15-minute show, however long it is. So, yes, college football weren't from the NFL. Keep things short. Keep things con- concise. Eliminate the, st- the clock stopping at the end of every first down. Speed up the game and shorten that timeout. Because even if you're at a game watching it, no matter if it's a, a, a tight game or if it's a blowout, you're sitting there looking down at the guy on the sidelines. I know I do. And I'm wondering, hey, bro, uh, you got to get off the field. Well, this game needs to go on. But I'm realizing the timeouts, those commercials have to get ran. He can't move until they got all their money. And, and they just stand around. No, that's great. You, I, like I said, that was on my list. I'm glad you took it. Huge. And and, and reason it's a pet peeve of mine. I'll go. I'll go uh, on to the on field product. Yeah. You know, it's it slows down the game. It slows down the momentum. And those all the rules were put into place back when they still the game was slower, less plays. With the way the way these way these teams get chunks now, there's a first down every other play, literally. And so the clock is constantly stopped. It, it's not that hard. I remember they actually tried years ago. Actually, the year that uh, it was 06, uh, they tried it, and the clock would start after first downs, and it was a big deal. And then and they did away with it probably because of advertisers. But what I also like about if you if you quit giving those automatic um, you know clock stoppages, guess what you do? You bring the running game back in more that that is oh almost gosh. that is yeah. almost gone from college football. Um, you know, all of a sudden now you get rewarded for a ground game if you've got a lead rather than no lead is safe at this with with the 
you know, the clock stop each at the first down, no lead safe. So now all of a sudden you've brought a ground game back into it. So now you've brought you've brought more plays, you've brought more players that are important and things like that just by a simple eliminating one rule. Um, I know, you know, if you want to do it away to where they still do it, say the last two minutes of a game, okay, I'll concede something. But uh, it, it is getting ridiculous. You know, you go to a game, you're sitting there, it's a little chilly, and you look down – and everybody's just standing around waiting for the commercials, you know, to be over with and waiting for this and waiting for that. It's just – it's – the game was not meant to take that long. Me and you both are high school football fans, Jay. How much fun is it to go to a high school football game on a Friday night and it takes a little over two hours and you still see an exciting game. You still see most – you know, most of the time – it's it's still a lot of fun and it's two hours and like ten minutes, you're out. And you got you saw a complete game with half times and everything. It can be done. There is there's got to be a gray area here. We it, we got to start reeling this thing in. Jeff, it's funny you mentioned that the, high, the our, our love for high school football because in high school football, I, I I've interviewed a guy that runs a, the VP of a network here that uh, televises high school football games. He's been doing high school football and basketball with high school sports in the area for like 20, 25 years. I mean, he's really entrenched in the sport high school locally here at Indi- in Indiana. Indianapolis specifically. And I've noticed no matter if there's a the WHMB 40 channel 40 or the ISC sports network here locally, or any of the other networks, uh, um, Indiana SRN that are broadcasting on the TV or the radio, the high school football games, they don't change their broadcast based off the, based off the commercials or the game doesn't, doesn't get prolonged because of the commercials. It, the speed keeps going and the TV networks, they adjust to the game, the high school game, and the high school rules. It can be done in college. I know they're stubborn. Jeff, what is number three on your list? Your last and final way that college football can improve. Well, this is a good one. You've already touched on it. The sports become too hop, top heavy. And I, ha- I hate this one because I'm a high state fan. It benefits me by being top heavy. We <laughs> automatically are in a playoff discussion every year. When, when they, when, uh, you know, as soon as you're allowed to play high states in playoff contention. So it benefits me greatly, but I, but it's just too much. Uh, you, you touched on some of it. You got to start forcing risky matchups outside, you know, outside of the conference, which once again, get rid of these preseason polls, you know, quit putting so much risk on one loss in a season. If you force teams to play, you know, harder schedules throughout, then everybody's going to take a loss or two, but you're going to get to see some great matchups finally. Like instead of, you know, Ohio State or Alabama or whoever scheduling these big games 10 years ahead of time and then we have to wait, just just schedule it because they act like it can't be done, but we do the playoffs. They find out a couple weeks later they're playing. You can You can schedule season to season. College basketball does it all the time. You know, make teams travel outside of the region. You already touched on it. There's no reason we can't see Bama go to Wisconsin in November. There's no reason we can't see Penn State go to LSU in September and play in the heat. There's absolutely no reason except for to try and protect these records because we don't want these teams to lose because we want the name brands up in the co- – we don't. They do. They yeah. want they want them up high. They don't. So and then they're like, well, if they do that, what they're worried about is well, then Cincinnati or Memphis, they're going to sneak up there. No, no, make them do it too. If they think they deserve you know, to be one of the quote unquote big boys, then you know you put you put a uh, top five you know conferences on their schedule automatically. Um, you know, force everybody to play each other. You come up with you know as simple as we seen Notre Dame do it last year. They adjusted their schedule, played. An ACC schedule, you know what I mean? And, you know, last year was unique, but they still did it. I know they play a half one anyway, but you can alter things to get it done. Um, make cross-conference schedules. Uh, make the Big 12 like, okay, next year the Big 12, they they play the ACC or whatever. At least you're starting to force these teams to play each other instead of avoiding each other. Who cares if Ohio State plays Alabama next year and potentially ruins the big game at the end of the season Everybody will watch that game too. The NFL does it every year, year in and year out. There's there's week one games this year. Like who's not excited for Tampa Bay Dallas? You, you know, there's no reason you can't do it, uh, and things like that. And it, it here's what it eventually does. You do this. You help recruiting because kids are like, okay, I can go to this school now and still get to play Alabama. 
and not risk sitting for three years. So now I might take a risk on this school. You start spreading the talent out. Once you spread the talent out, guess what? Those teams are going to get better. Now you can spread the money out. So now instead of concentrating on 10 schools, maybe we've got an actual 25 schools that are eligible. In 10 years from now, we could have 25 schools eligible to actually win the championship. To me, that's a great thing. Um, you know, it's you know, I guess it's easy for me to say now, <laughs> you know, as an Ohio State fan. But as far as making the sport better, I, we we have to we have to do. There's there's too many good teams out there to just play a conference schedule every year, and then and then we can we have to imagine what would have happened if they'd have played. I think that's ridiculous. Jeff, you know, I thought about something. You talked about how think schedules are made ten years in advance. Think about seven to ten years ago. It's 2021. Let's go back. 2010, well, I go back further, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013. There were two teams that were really good back then, Oregon, Ohio State. They play each other week two in this season. Now, let's imagine Oregon, they have had different coaches, different quarterbacks, different players. They've had to deal with COVID a different way than Ohio State had to. Let's just imagine one of those schools didn't have a really good coach and didn't have the program that they are, and they fell off. Oregon Ohio State would not be the game that it was that it is going to be ten years ago. Think about last year. You say the Rose Bowl matchup. Whoever plays in the Rose Bowl automatically plays each other week two in the following season. So after the 2010 Rose Bowl, instead of saying, "Oh, we'll play you again ten years from now," you played them week two in the very next year. The BCS back at that time would properly weight that game win and loss for quality of opponent. I think you're going to get a better game that way. Think about it. Also, so many ideas when you went through that, Jeff. The NFL, they do year by year. They have a big old schedule release, and it makes sense the way they do it. They do kind of have, I know, an AFC conference, an NFC, I mean, AFC division, NFC division. I forget exactly how they pick who does that, maybe by rotation. But it may yeah, then you get a conference, you get a or you get a division winner schedule, you know, yeah. if if you win one. So the NFL does it and it works. Imagine college football fans out there saying, "Oh, so the NFL schedule comes out on May the 12th. How about the college football schedule? It comes out May 5th because well, let's just say that since college football starts a week before the NFL, the college football schedule comes out May 5th, the uh NFL May 12th. ESPN Fox CBS Sports might even put something out. They'll eat that up, bro. And so there's so many different ideas. And you mentioned the schedule thing 10 years in advance. I think that's one of the hindrances that having the conferences run everything really, really hurts them. Last but not least, Jeff, this is one. It's been a pet peeve of mine. I actually looked at this last year. I did a little bit of something on the NCAA tournament, college basketball, and went in depth and looked at how they figure out who the field of 68 is going to be. Give clear cut criteria for how the committee picks who is in the playoff. I don't care if you're, if, I don't care if it's, oh, the committee picks the, the top two teams. I don't care if it's a, a 14 playoff, 18 playoff, 16 playoff, 16 team playoff, 133. I don't care who it is. Give me a clear cut, concrete way that you get from zero or 133 down to 50, down to 25 to figure out who that pool is going to be in that playoff and then tell me how you get from one two three four five all the way down to however many are in that playoff i think expansion is coming i think it's inevitable i think i mentioned that to you earlier can't give you too many details on air that's coming later on for the podcast but if you give us clear-cut criteria yes it's going to give you and i less to talk about it's going to give us less talking points or less conversational pieces because we know exactly what they're looking for what the criteria is and you're taking the subjectivity, sub, subjectivity out of the, mem- the committee members' heads and their pins and their heads just because they have a step-by-step guide about what to go through. The NCAA Men's Basketball Tournament, Jeff, they literally have on their website, NCAA.org, I believe. You can look out and see not just their criteria. They map it out by month, so by m- February or by December, this happens. By January, this happens. By February, this happens. And they map it out by a region. So instead of having 13 people be the ones to look at the entire country, somebody might have the South. Somebody might have the Midwest. Or there might be multiple people inside of one region. You can't really deny, yes, 68 teams, that's a lot. You could say somebody might not make it. That's true. 
But for the most part, somebody that makes it, they're maybe a fringe team anyway. So if they make it, yes. If they don't make it, okay. It's whatever. But also, you know exactly, exactly what they're looking for. At least with the BCF. BCS. We knew it was a computer. We knew somewhat of the polls that were used to make up that final poll via the computer. And we knew the idea. We knew the criteria. Now, the computer, we don't know all the ins and outs, but we do know somewhat of what goes into that poll. I personally think, Jeff, if they give us clear-cut criteria, it would enhance them, help them, and they wouldn't have to answer so many hard questions on ESPN when the rankings are released. Yeah, and it wouldn't let the coaches off the hook when they can say, "Ah, yes. oh, we should be." It would it would get rid of all that. And and what I would say as far as like you and I as host, guess guess what the other side of that is? Yes, we don't get to have shows about guessing who's going to make it. But guess what we can do? Now we can once we see the criteria. Now we may be looking at let's say um, let's say there's eight teams. Now we're looking at the kind of what we're doing with the NBA right now. We're looking at ten through. Seven and now me and you are like okay. They said that whatever, whether it's point differential, whether it's strength of schedule. So now we get to do a show and maybe we actually get to talk about football instead of what will we, <laughs> instead of what will what we think a room full of people that we've never met mm-hmm. will will think like instead of guessing like oh I wonder I wonder it, what they think of this team or I wonder how they feel about this we can be like no I'm telling you this team's coming in with this defense they've only given up you know 27 points a game uh, they're gonna we know that they're gonna weigh that in so now all of a sudden guess what me and you get to have a conversation about defense or offense or or game planning and things like that instead of constantly uh, this constant um I don't even know what you call it. It's almost like a political format, mm-hmm. you, you know. So I think that you know, I think guys like me and you will we would run with these advances that we've talked about. I guess that's a greater point here. People that that love football and love to watch football and appreciate the game, um, even in we always insult casual fans, like oh well they don't know, so we got to give them the number beside the team and then they click it on. They 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 don't care if if you and I. If that's how they watch it and they enjoy it that way, you and I will say, oh, this USC, you know, this USC Oregon game in November or whatever, this is going to be really good. Here's why. Now they know. They don't, they don't need to just, they don't need, um, you know, ESPN to tell them, you know, to hand feed them. You know, people are, it, it's not that complicated <laughs> of a sport. People will understand it. And I think, I think you're totally right on that. I think it's, um, I think the I think that's actually maybe the best point of the night is you give me the criteria. Now I, I've got something to to sink my teeth into. I've got something to look at. Now I can really start judging teams and figuring out who's going to be here and who's going to be there. Um, so I personally am for that idea. Yeah, man. I think that the criteria and just making really things go the way that businesses are ran. I mean, you're a business owner um, or you were, I don't know if you're still doing that now, but even for our shows, we have step-by-step guides as far as getting a guest, letting them know what we're going to talk about. If you're going to give them a, like a sentence or two, that's great. Make it more free flowing. If you want them to have details, time slots, 702 are doing this, 718 are doing this, like a radio show does. That's another way but also, you got to make sure, like we mentioned off air, is my microphone plugged in? Is my charger to my computer plugged in? Do I have light? I mean, the details that we need for a show, you would think those are the same details that they would need for the for the playoff. But unfortunately, it's not. Yeah, because right now, essentially, what they're saying is here's what they t- here's what they tell the coaches and the teams: uh, you need to you need to make a splash on on TV. But, uh, so imagine last year a team that obviously is close to you. If Indiana knew, if Indiana would have known halfway th- into their season after the Ohio State game, what else they had to do. Like imagine if they had some criteria to like really go. Here's how we can get in instead of be instead of just hoping. Um, you know that's just one team. Cincinnati. Imagine if they didn't have to hope if they knew. But then once again, let's if you put this all in a big, put a bow around it in a big present. Now imagine Cincinnati is where they were last year, and they know they've got, let's say, North Carolina even coming up on their schedule. So now, like, oh, look, we we have another our outer conference game coming up here in a couple weeks. This is our chance. Instead of being like, well, 
we, we didn't play anybody out of conference. We hope that they think that's good enough and it wasn't and things like that. So if you mix all these together, what we've created is an actual a closer to a level playing field of the sport that just is amazing. Jeff, I was looking at something very, very quickly. We got a little bit of time left. We're going to do a little hypothetical, not so much hypothetical, like we were as far as ways the game can advance or get, can improve. Week one of this upcoming season has a lot of amazing, amazing matchups. I'm going to go through a, li a list of them. Uh, some of them you may say, well, Jay, some of the things that you guys have discussed are happening in a snapshot. In a nutshell, not every single year. So just hear me out. But, Jeff, we got games. I got – there's 10 games here. I'm not going to give you all 10. Um, let's go five through one. This is coming from Athlon.com. They have ranked the top 10 games for week one of the upcoming season. I'm going to give you five through one. You let me know the game that you're most looking forward to watching. LSU at UCLA. That is in Pasadena. I assume the Rose Bowl. Notre Dame at Florida State. In Tallahassee, Florida State is at home. Penn State at Wisconsin, week one in Madison. That's, I'm amazed. Miami versus Alabama. That's in Atlanta, the Georgia Dome. And then Clemson versus Georgia. And I believe that game is in Charlotte, North Carolina. Clemson versus Georgia. Miami versus Alabama. Penn State at Wisconsin. Notre Dame at Florida State. LSU at UCLA. Which game are you looking forward to the most? I'm going to say, I'll say Clemson, Georgia, because we always want to see how a team responds after a huge year that Clemson had, new quarterback. Um, how will how will the tradition continue? I think Georgia's con a contender. I think their quarterback, to me, he is on, you know, a lot of people tell me he's going to be great. Uh, he looked good at times, you know, last year coming in. So I'm. I'm a little on the fence about that, but I think if he's good, they can be a contender. And, you know, that's a great interconference game. I love the Alabama Miami matchup uh, also, but if, if I got to, if I got to pick one, I, I got Clemson, Georgia. I think you learn a lot about those two schools and this goes to our point, but now we need, I think we could have matchups like these. Now we need them. Let's put them, let's put them in October. Let's just throw them in the middle of the season. You, you know what I mean? So this is what's, best about college football but then what else have we've done even if you take the top 10 matchups now you've got 20 teams uh, and there's another 100 teams that have okay man force all these matchups because it's i hate that so clemson or georgia are going to play a great game miami alabama are going to play a great game two of those teams have to fight their way through the rest of the season to get back in playoff contention i hate that that's a thing because it you know it it tries to persuade teams not to take these things so uh yeah i like i like clemson georgia sounds like interesting very interesting what about you man i want to do this so i was gonna go i was gonna try and be the big 10 homer and take penn state at wisconsin but i don't like uh sean clifford at all i mean he's a decent quarterback i don't think he's going to be a guy that can be that and with wisconsin's system and how they're shifting and how, just based off last year both penn state and wisconsin were down i think they'll be better i just don't think it's going to be as appealing of a game to me week one yeah i think it could be a close game not a good game if that makes any yes. sense which is fine yes. I'm, I'm here for it now i'm here for the game so i'm going with i'm going to go different than you only so we're not picking the same game miami versus alabama and atlanta a pet peeve of mine i'm sure it may be of yours as well atlanta is kind of like the alabama second home it used to be Legion Field in, what, Birmingham, where they used to host the Alabama-Auburn game, and then I forget what school got upset saying, wait, you, 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 we're playing in the same place every year, and then one school pulled out, it's closer drive for you, and it's closer for, than it is for us. So they started going to the different schools to host the game. But Alabama plays in Atlanta all the time. I mean, every single year. You got bowl games. You, you, you're you making BCS um, New Year's Six Bowls that are in Atlanta, which aid Alabama. So I'm going Miami versus Alabama because you got Bryce Young, a new quarterback. He didn't really play much. He is a guy that was sitting behind Mac Jones. Last year, people were saying Bryce Young is going to be the guy. You're forgetting Mac Jones. We see what Mac Jones did last year in college football. Also, Derek King, a guy who was super senior, coming back for another year in college football. I personally don't think he's going to, he's going to have the arm this year or after next year to make him an NFL quarterback. But this is one of those games. You showcase your skills, and you're going to have the scouts, the executives, the NFL coaches look back early on and say, De'Eric King, 
We doubted you going into this game. You started to turn things around, throw the ball like nobody knew you could. And now we're going to take you a little bit higher than expected in the NFL draft. Now we got to continue what we do. That's a great springboard springboard game for either person. It's still a neutral site game. And I do believe those Miami Hurricanes fans down there in South Florida, they'll make the trip to the ATL to watch that game because they know that game not only is a great stepping stone and starting point for the season, but it's also a great spot and a great way to see how good we are with comparing ourselves to college football elites. Yeah, I, I like it. I, I think Miami's defense is is, is starting to uh, get some of that defensive speed back and stuff, which can be a problem. I really, really, really wish Derek King hadn't got hurt at the end of last season. I hope he's I hope he's 100. percent You know, I really like the kid. Really rooting for him. And you're exactly right. That's the kind of guy that, you know. I, he may not be an NFL quarterback, but he he might he might be a great college quarterback, and he can he can come up and get you if your if your new guy falters a little bit. So uh, I, I'm, it's definitely an intriguing matchup, and it would, yeah yeah this, this is big Wh- yeah whoever wins I mean it's a springboard just like I said, but unfortunately because of everything we talked about you know so now you're locked into this you know hey whoever wins this we're in the playoff hunt like it's done for first week of the season which like I say. Great talking points. I don't know how great it is for the game, but, but believe me, I will be watching. Yeah, I think that he has a great chance to be the Lamar Jackson of this year. Not saying he's going to be as um, good as Lamar Jackson was the year he won the Heisman, but Lamar Jackson showed people in college football he could be electric with his arm and with his legs in college football. The Eric King, a guy that I don't think is really on many people's top five future Heisman picks, he could really just start a year and say, well, y'all doubted me before the season? Don't doubt me now. Jeff, this has been fun, man. This has been a lot of fun. If you could, let the good people know where they can connect with you on Twitter and check out all of your shows and tell them about the Off the Ball Network. I've mentioned it at the top of every show. Haven't really gone too much in depth. Please do it, sir, if you could. Uh, yeah, first of all, you know, I do Jeff Needs Sports. I also do Jeff Needs Helps. Uh, if, I don't know if you ever get to see this, um, do some comic book stuff, some movie stuff. Uh, most importantly, go to offtheballnetwork.com. Uh, we've got a, a, a group of guys over there. It's really amazing what we're doing. We're up to 12, 13, you know, different sports podcasts now, plus guys writing. Uh, some really cool, st- really cool stuff going on right there. Go there and check that out. You can find everybody. You can find their links. Um, you know, Jay's – it was a huge supporter. Now he's a member. He helps us out. He's you know, a great talent. He means a lot. I love being on this show. It's great. So, And then you can find Jeff Needs Sports um, on any of the podcast platforms that you love. And uh, you can find me on Twitter, at jhunt006. You know, get at me. Talk to me. I like to, I like to interact with the fans just like Jay does. And, um, you know, I'm happy to have you on. And I appreciate everybody that listens and uh, watches. Yeah, guys, Jeff, this has been fun. Um, I love the college football game. I love what uh, what this season might be. And, Jeff, I really appreciate you coming back on the podcast. Um, hopefully, I know we'll do some stuff soon. Just not sure how soon that'll be. We'll do stuff together. But, Jeff, I really appreciate you one more time. Come on the podcast, man. It means a lot. Yeah, you're the best, Jeff. As I think back and look over what Jeff and I discussed, his list, my list, comparing and contrasting the two ideas. There's one thing that neither one of us had on our list. Targeting. We talk about it all the time every year in college football. There needs to be a targeting one or a targeting two. Or some people believe that targeting should not be in the game at all. But neither one of us had targeting. And it made me really think about how in the moment we get sometimes during games, we focus on the targeting. And as that has been a problem in college football, then there needs to be some discussion and some parameters set around when they should and when they should not make that call. I don't think that's one of the major issues or one of the bigger issues in college football. In a vacuum, in a small space, in a small moment of time, you will think that's it. That's the one that needs to be fixed first. No sir, Bob. At least to me, my personal opinion, I think that is a problem but not one of the major problems, plural, that college football currently has right now. There is a plan possibly to do something like this for college basketball. Haven't nailed that down just yet or had a guest to come on, schedule that to happen, but there may be something before the next college basketball season where somebody comes on and we discuss ways to improve the college basketball. 
Because as popular as that sport is, that sport, it's not perfect either. Thank you guys so much for listening and enjoying another episode of the Jay Stevens Podcast. As always, you can follow me on Twitter at jsteven07. You can also send all of your emails to jstevens317 at gmail.com. Remember to always subscribe, rate, and review. It's a great way for people that are searching for a new podcast to listen to to come across this one. Then remember to always get the word out about the podcast via word of mouth. The things that we enjoy in life, we are almost willing and somewhat wired to tell other people about so no if this was your first episode or if you have been listening since episode number one be sure to let people know about the podcast this has been episode 199 of the jay stewart podcast i will see you next time <laughs>